Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Is hyperthreading really needed to play games? Does it really offer a benefit or is it just more hype? Today, we're gonna find out. I have two AMD CPUs here that are both four core processors, one of which has SMT, otherwise known more popularly as hyperthreading. However, AMD can't call it that because hyperthreading is actually an Intel trademark term. However, whether you call it SMT or hyperthreading, it is the same technology. AMD's Ryzen 3 1300X and Ryzen 5 1500X. Both first generation Zen cores, both with four true processing cores, but the 1500X has SMT, which I'm gonna call hyperthreading from this point on because it just sounds cooler. But otherwise, these are very similar in most respects. They both run at 3.6 gigahertz on all the cores, as you'll see in the benchmarks in just a minute. So they're very, very similar processors. So what is hyperthreading, you ask? Great question. The full answer is long and complex, so I'll give you the short, short version. It allows you to assign two different tasks to each CPU core, essentially increasing your thread count to eight. It's preemptive multitasking, but at the thread level within your CPU. It increases the amount of jobs that can be assigned, but not actually the amount that can be done at any given moment because you've not increased the number of true processing cores within the chip. Hyperthreading helps by hiding memory latency and allowing the prefetch buffers and other elements within the pipeline of the CPU stay full by alternating the tasks that they're working on to make sure all the various execution units within the CPU basically stay busy at any given point in time. Hyperthreading does not generally make your CPU a lot faster, but what it does do is make it smoother and more responsive and help clean out the hitches and stutters that happen when you run out of processing threads. It is important to note there is one other difference between the 1300X and the 1500X. The 1300X has eight megabytes of level three cache and the 1500X has 16 megabytes of level three cache. While it is true that you can take a 1500X, disable hyperthreading, SMT in the BIOS, and get pretty close, it's not really the same results because you can't adjust the level three cache size. And that is why I have both real CPUs and these tests you're about to see were actually done on the real chips. One question that I am sure is bound to come up is why these two CPUs? Why not use something faster like say a i5 7600K versus say a i7 7700K. Four cores, four threads? Four cores, eight threads? And the simple answer to that is we're not looking for absolute performance numbers here because there are so many CPUs covered by the does hyperthreading matter question. Instead, we're trying to figure out is there a difference in performance? Is there a difference in smoothness and frame pacing delivery between four core, four thread and four core, eight thread CPUs? And we can do that whether we use mid-range Ryzen first gen chips or the best that Intel ever made before moving to six core processors. Likewise, we could have used an i5 2500K or an i7 2600K, both from 2011, and it would have accomplished the same goal. Much lower total frame rates, but there'd still be a difference between them, between a four core, four thread and a four core, eight thread CPU. I picked the Ryzen's for a couple of reasons. Number one, I have them. Number two, they are an amazing value for the money. Right now, you can pick up a Ryzen 5 1500X for like $60 to $70 on eBay, but a used i7 7700K is like $250. It's faster, but not so much faster to justify that price point. And furthermore, the Ryzen CPUs can be upgraded to an eight or 16 core CPU on the same motherboard. Take that, Intel. For our test bench today, we're using the ASUS ROG Strix X470-F motherboard with 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 MHz CL16 RAM installed. We have a Gigabyte RX 5700 XT gaming overclock card. It's a little bit overpowered for these CPUs, but it lets us see how well the CPUs perform rather than being graphics card limited. Yes, it's a CPU test. And yes, in theory, using the best available graphics card would make sense, but let's be real here. Everybody would just roll their eyes if I stuck an RTX 2080 Ti on here. That removes all graphic card limitations, but it's kind of a silly choice 
for four core versus four core eight thread. So I went with something somewhat reasonable in the 5700 XT. MSI Afterburner provided the real time performance numbers and benchmarks you're about to see. The video was recorded on a second computer on a hardware capture card. The test bench did not even know it was being recorded. So no performance was lost from that. Links in the video description below to Amazon, Newegg, and eBay for all of these items and a couple of suggested items if you can swing the budget. To be completely honest, if you are buying now, I would skip both of these CPUs and simply get yourself a Ryzen 5 1600 and enjoy the power and performance of a six core 12 thread chip. It really isn't that much more than a 1500X, even used on eBay. I will have some more thoughts for these CPUs after the benchmarks, so please stick around for those. But you guys have waited long enough, so for now, let's get to the benchmarks. A quick update before I show you the benchmarks themselves. I really wish I had gone and done an RTX 2060 Super or something similar because the clock speed and the boost issues at 1080p on the 5700 XT is still broken. It's not stable and it does affect a couple of the benchmarks you're about to see. I do call them out so you can be aware of it and I primarily want you to focus on the CPU usage and the lows rather than the averages because that's really what we're looking at here. But since I've already done all the benchmarks and I'm not going to go back and redo this many tests, we kind of have to live with it for the moment. Just be aware that whenever I call the 5700 XT fussy, this is a good example of what I mean. It's a good card. The drivers just need some more work. Give AMD six months and that fine wine technology will have it all sorted out. But for now, here's the benchmarks. Our first benchmark today is Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I know, I know, it's everybody's favorite benchmark, slash S. And what's interesting here is the Ryzen 3 1300X on the top is absolutely pegged at 100% CPU usage. The Ryzen 5 1500X on the bottom is running about 60 to 70% usage. But remember, it has four cores, eight threads. And so if we're over 50% on it, then we're using more than four cores. But wait, you say, the frame rate's higher on the 1300X. What in the world is going on? Well, I probably should not have broken my own rule in using the RX 5700XT because it probably means I need to go back and redo these using an NVIDIA GPU. Take a look at the frame rate relative to the clock speed on the video card. These things throttle hard and really mess up the benchmarks. And unfortunately, this is kind of an RX 5700XT thing. 56 frames per second on the 1300X, 51 on the 1500X. Yeah, now there's a bunch more benchmarks coming, so don't, don't bail on me yet. But this is ridiculous because the 1500X is clearly going to be better in Assassin's Creed Odyssey than the 1300X. This game wants more than four cores. This game will absolutely use more than four cores. It will use the hyper-threading for smoothness. But the performance there, and this is why charts aren't everything, you've got to see the footage. The performance there is due to the fact that the RX 5700XT was throttling more on that because it just won't stay at a certain speed and the drivers and everything are just... <sighs> now, Assassin's Creed Odyssey is the video card's fault. This one is my fault, but don't run off. I promise it's the last benchmark here that has any kind of squirrely stuff. The rest are fine. These aren't on the same map and it was a complete oversight on my part. I accept full responsibility. So while the frame rate numbers are gonna be kind of weird here, that's not why this game is included. Take a look at the CPU usage in terms of percentage right in the middle of MSI Afterburner. Notice that the 1300X is basically pegged to 100% all of the time. And notice that the 1500X is not, but the 1500X does go above 50% at times because it's using all four cores and it goes into the hyper threading at times. Now, many of these games don't like to use the hyper threads. They want more real cores. And when I come back around and test this on a six core chip and compare four to six cores, you'll see that a little bit more clearly. But because these aren't on the same map, honestly, the frame rate numbers aren't directly comparable. When I do the four versus six cores, I promise you they will be on the same map. I won't do this again. Uh, it, that just was carelessness on my part, so my apologies. 
94 frames per second on the 1300X and 79 frames per second on the 1500X. If anybody just watches the first two benchmarks, you might come away from this going, hyper-threading is stupid. Why in the world would you ever want hyper-threading turned on? Well, okay, patience, patience. We're coming to a better benchmark, I promise. Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and these were on the same map, woo! And these are also tested using uh, basically the same play, the same combat over the course of 10 minutes. So this is a much, much better comparison than the last one. Take a look at the CPU usage. Now the 1300X is not pegged out to 100%. This is a fairly lightweight game. It doesn't require very many demanding resources, but it is using a majority of the CPU. The 1500X is using half because of course it's twice as many threads. 174 to 183, the actual average frame rate doesn't change by much and hyper-threading does not generally make games faster. It makes them smoother. Look at the 1% and 0.1% low. Given that this is a replay of a professional tournament by professional teams on the same map, this is much more comparable. It's a much better benchmark. I need to do this for Call of Duty Black Ops 4. 58 to 100 on the 1% low and 8 to 31 on the 0.1% low. Now remember, the 1300X was not 100% utilized. It was only using like three of the four cores. So there's no reason whatsoever to have hyper-threading ever, except that's wrong. It's little micro stutters that don't show up in averages and that don't show up in just viewing footage, but that exist within the game. Far Cry New Dawn, the full price DLC to Far Cry 5. This is a really good example of where you have to take benchmarks with a grain of salt. Some benchmarks stress the graphics card, some stress the CPU, and some stress both. In this particular case, what you're looking at in this benchmark is not really caring about the CPU as much. It's using more CPU. Notice on the 1300X, it's using basically all four cores. And on the 1500X, it's using four cores. But if you look really, really closely, you'll notice the frame rates are about the same. And you'll notice that the 1% and 0.1% low numbers aren't that far off either. However, this is an open world game. And if I played it, then I would be playing it and showing that to you. But of course, A, that takes time, and B, that requires you get a certain distance into the game to find a place that is effective. I played Far Cry 5, and I played it for oh, about five hours or so before I honestly got bored with it. And it makes more of a difference in that. Ghost Recon Breakpoint, uh, the Division 2 are good examples of where that has a greater effect. 74 and 74 on the average, 55 and 55 on the 1% low, and 44 and 52 on the 0.1% low. You might think the hyper-threading doesn't matter, but there's no open world exploration or map generation in this benchmark. This is more of a graphics card test, but I include it because it's here and I put it in all of my videos, but take this one with a healthy grain of salt. Fortnite, everybody's favorite battle royale game. This is tested in Team Rumble. This does a couple of things. First of all, it lets me get a full benchmark in because you respawn. In the normal standard game, you would die and then you go back to the main menu and I don't ever live long enough or do enough battle to ever actually get anything going. So here, we've got two full battles benchmarked and recorded. 1080p high detail, so it's running at 100% render resolution, which is the default in the game. And it's remarkably good performance. Even on the 4-core, four 4-thread four chip, take a look at that. It is using all of them. Notice it's using 90%, 94%, 88% the 4 core, four 4-thread chip. Down on the 1500X, it's bouncing around 50%. There's 59%, there's 65%. There are moments in the game where it needs more. Average frame rate wise, the hyper-threading means nothing to performance. If you're looking for faster overall averages, hyper-threading's not it. You need six cores. And I'll show you Fortnite again when I do the four-core versus six-core comparison. But if you want a smoother experience, if you want a game that hitches less often in general, there are, interestingly enough, a couple of odd exceptions where actually the reverse is true. It hitches less with hyper-threading turned off. But those are the exceptions, not the rule. In Fortnite, you very much want your hyper-threading turned on if you don't want the game hitching all over the place. 
In terms of average frame rates, 163 to 149, keep in mind, live gameplay, different things are happening, I'm in different parts of the map, I'm engaged in combat different amounts of times, and these benchmarks are of the whole game. It's a tie. That's, that's effectively a tie given the battle orientation, given the nature of Fortnite. Look at the 1% low and the 0.1% low. That's not a tie. The 1% low is nearly three times higher on the 1500X. When you saw the CPU usage jump to like 58%, 59, 60%, it's the computer's into the hyper threads. On the 1300X, every one of those is a hitch. Every time it wants to use more than four threads. And that includes the whole computer, not just the game. Windows, anything running in the background, your web browser, uh, your drivers, anything. Your antivirus wants to scan something while you're playing. All of that needs a thread. And so the 1300X has nothing to give, whereas the 1500X does. If you want to play Fortnite, it's fine on a 4-core, four 4-thread four chip. It's better on a 4-core, four 8-thread chip. Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Whoa, this is an interesting one. Take a look at the CPU usage. Take a look at the CPU usage on the 1500X. Notice it's pegging out in the 90% range at times. Not there as I'm speaking, but it did a couple of times. Not only does this game absolutely not run smoothly on a 4-core, four 4-thread four chip, it's not even great on a 4-core, four 8-thread chip. This really wants 6 cores, 12 threads at a minimum. I mean, it will play. It does play. I did play for a while. But yeesh, it was, um, yeah, it was rough. It was better on the 1500X, but it was still not great. 69 frames per second average on the 1500X versus 49 on the 1300X. But that belies the problems on the 1300X where there were complete pauses and freezes in the game. 29 to 48 on the 1% low and 22 to 39 on the 0.1% low. Those numbers are accurate. I was actually playing the game. I would not want to play this game on a 4-core, four 4-thread four chip. And I'm not excited about playing it on a 4-core, 8-thread chip either. I've got almost 40 hours in this game at this point. I am playing it almost every day. Not for very long because I'm busy making videos. But it, it is fun. It genuinely is fun, at least for me. And it really needs more than 4-cores, regardless of whether you have hyper-threading or not. Overwatch, however, is a completely different story. Overwatch will play just fine on four cores and four threads. It is smoother on a four core, eight thread chip. The hyper threading does smooth out portions of it. If you're a competitive player, you would not want to be on a 1300X or any four core, four thread chip. But if you're casual, if you're just playing for fun, if it's just something you do on the weekend, then sure, yeah, rock on. It absolutely is great. But the 1% and 0.1% lows are definitely better if you have hyper-threading. 144 to 166, yeah, it's a little bit faster on the 1500X, but not tremendously so. 1% lows, yeah, that's a pretty solid 25% boost in performance. But of course, if you're not a super professional player, 82 1% lows are just fine. The 0.1% lows when you die with four threads, then it hitches when you jump back, whereas it doesn't hitch as much on the 1500X. It's it's really fine on either CPU. Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Yeah, this needs a whole lot more CPU power. Look at the, well, the 1300X is of course pegged. Look at the 1500X. It's not pegged 100% of the time, but it slams into 99% several times. You absolutely want a minimum of eight threads if you want anything approaching smooth gameplay in this. And frankly, I personally would also consider six cores and 12 threads to be the minimum. We'll look at that in the next video. But you can get away with four cores, eight threads, especially if they're faster. If you have an i7 7700K at 4.5 to 5 gigahertz, then sure, it won't be as bad as it is here, but yeah. Here's where the averages lie to you. 89 to 101. So, hey, four cores, four threads is fine, right? Yeah, no. 26 to 46. That's not quite double. Maybe 80% faster in the 1% lows and then more than double in the 0.1% lows. And this is the built-in benchmark and not live gameplay. I promise when you're jumping around between terrains and obstacles and avoiding the bad guys and shooting, you do not want to be on a four-thread processor in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. 
Steep, the snowboarding, hang gliding, skiing simulator thingy. Let me know in the comments below if you want this to continue to be included in benchmarks. I have not gotten a lot of feedback one way or another. Did people like this game? Do they play it? It's something different. It's not another first person shooter. It's not another esports game. So I thought, well, let's include this and see what people think. But if you guys don't want to see it, well, I'll find something else. Suggestions for games are always welcome down in the comment section below. This runs remarkably well on both of these CPUs. 92 frames per second on the 1300X versus 101 on the 1500X, and 51 and 49 and 34 and 33. So it really didn't care, at least in the built-in benchmark, about hyperthreading. The Division 2, the sequel and follow-up to the very cool open world game, Division 1, which I actually beat and quite enjoyed a bunch. I'm having fun in this one as well. It's a little on the bland side because it kind of basically feels like an extended DLC to the first one. There's a couple of new features, but it kind of pretty much is basically the same game. Now, that's not a bad thing, but in terms of performance, does it run on a 4-core, four 4-thread four chip? It does. It's not great. It's hitchy and stuttery in places. The performance is definitely slower than you'd like. But unlike Ghost Recon Breakpoint, which is not, in my opinion, playable on four cores, four threads, this is. It's just lousy. So even if you've got a fast chip, if you've got an i5, 6600K uh, overclocked to 4.5 gigahertz, and you go, yeah, but I have gigahertz, man. Yeah, but you've only got four threads, and it's still not going to be a great experience. It's not unplayable, but yeah, the, the extra threads, the hyper-threading makes a difference. Frankly, in my opinion, this game, like several of the others we've talked about, desperately wants six cores and 12 threads. Take a look at the 1500X. We're bouncing. There's 80%, 75%. At times, it's up to 90%, either 79, 76%, 86%. It wants more. And keep in, I just, I cannot pound this hard enough. Hyperthreading is not real cores. When it goes over 50%, it smooths the game out, but it's not magic. It helps, but real cores help more. 76 to 115. That's a huge difference in one of the few places where you're going to see a real difference with the extra cores and threads. 1% low of 51 and 75, and the 0.1% low is wonky, probably a I, I don't know why. An explosion or something happened. Something overwhelmed the 1500X in that particular battle because this is not a benchmark. Even though the Division 2 has a built-in benchmark, I'm using live gameplay, something hitched and stuttered, and that's just going to happen. So go get yourself a 6-core or 8-core processor. Total War Three Kingdoms. Now, this is the game's built-in benchmark. And it's great for testing the graphics card. I'm not entirely convinced this is very good for testing the CPU. I'm interested in your feedback. I don't play this game. I have never launched this game in terms of actually playing it. And so the lack of experience there does not help. I, if, I, if there were more hours in the day, I would. In fact, I'd do live gameplay testing on everything if there was more hours in the day. Something tells me that when you fill the screen up with endless enemies and a huge battle and you get into it, that it's going to become very, very demanding. In this particular benchmark here, we are using basically four cores. We're using all the cores of the 1300X, and we're using all the cores and occasionally dipping into hyperthreading of the 1500X. But the performance is pretty similar, all things considered. Is this reflective of the game? I leave that for you to decide if this is your cup of tea. 63 versus 72 on the average, 30 versus 36 on the 1% low, and 26 versus 30 on the 0.1% low. Thank you all so much for watching all of those benchmarks. If you did so without fast forwarding, then two gold stars for you. It is greatly appreciated. These videos take days to put together between the benchmarks and constructing and filming and editing. And so your support, simply by watching the video, first of all, is appreciated. Hit that like button, leave a comment for engagement for the YouTube bots down below. And if possible, support us using the links in the description below. The affiliate links directly support the channel at no extra cost to you, regardless of what you buy. Even if you hit that Amazon link and buy a jar of peanut butter, for example, it actually still counts. So we appreciate it. 
If you're able to go beyond that and directly support the channel using either Patreon or Floatplane, there are some benefits to doing so. Those links are down there as well. And we use that support to make more of these videos and make them more often. Thank you. So what do I really think of these CPUs? Well, it all depends upon your expectations. A four core, four thread chip will absolutely still play lots of games. Wanna play Overwatch? No problem. Wanna play Ghost Recon Breakpoint? Yeah, no, it's a terrible experience. It is entirely down to game choice and what kind of performance that you're expecting out of it. So while some of you are gonna say, I'm just gonna hang on to my current four core, four thread chip for a while, Others may be going, holy smokes, it is way past time to upgrade. Did I mention the Ryzen 5 1600 is an amazing value for the money? It really is. Additional clock speed does help. An i7 7700K at five gigahertz will of course have a much higher average frame rate than a Ryzen 5 1500X because of the higher clock speed. But it's not necessarily smoother because if you run out of cores and threads, you're still gonna get micro stutters and dips in the frame pace and they're gonna bring those 1% and 0.1% low numbers down and just create a less ideal experience. And a Ryzen 5 1600 at 3.7 gigahertz fixed, which is a mild overclock, will not play games as fast as a 7700K at five gigahertz. The average frame rate will absolutely be lower but it might be smoother. And so the question is, do you want the highest possible maximum frame rate? Or do you want the smoothest, best overall frame pacing and frame delivery without a bunch of micro stutters in your gameplay? Slower clock speed, slower frame rate, but better experience with more cores and more threads. Another question I've been asked recently is, why not just buy an eight or a 12 core CPU and turn off hyper-threading and get the best of both worlds? Lots of threads and all true cores. Why? Why would you wanna hobble yourself like that? It is true that a very limited number of games, programs, and applications do react poorly to hyper-threading and perform a little bit slower by like two or 3%. But by far the vast majority of programs and applications and Windows itself react positively to hyperthreading. So turning it off is like trying to find a corner case where it's a benefit and ignoring the hundred other times where it's a benefit. So yeah, don't turn off hyperthreading. It's a good thing, like 98% of the time. Hyperthreading is here to stay and it's expanding. Expect four threads per core to come to an AMD CPU near you in the next couple of years, maybe two to three years from now, four threads per core. So that would be an eight core 32 thread processor or a 16 core 64 thread processor. It's not a new technology. IBM has had it for years in their workstation and server lines, but it's now cons coming to the consumer end. So hyperthreading isn't going anywhere. Thank you all for watching this very long discussion of hyper-threading. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you love it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with a big huge red button directly below. Remember to hit the bell notification icon next to the subscribe button to actually be notified when new videos come out. Links in the video description below as I mentioned before. Comments down in the comments section below. And as always, thank you for watching and I will see all of you next time.